walk today has a different shape than the place the Dutch called New Amsterdam. Hills were leveled, rivers were diverted. How can you tell what's the same and what's changed? If you walk along the East River Edge, South Street Seaport, that was all water. And ships could actually come up against buildings in areas that are now paved over. Nowadays, uh, most of these original hills have disappeared and the ponds have been filled in and the rivers are now covered over, but it's still down there. All those original water courses, and those swamps and all that stuff, it's still there. So, Doug, we are at the end of Montaigne's Rivulette. Yep, but you have to be 15 feet down below the ground to actually see it. What if you could get back in touch with how Manhattan looked 400 years ago? Well, it turns out you can. We worked for 10 years on something called the Manahata Project, which in some sense is a time machine. We could strip away the human features on the map, the, the roads, all the buildings, and then use that to drive us back in time to what Henry Hudson saw in 1609. The Dutch used sunken ships filled with rubbish to create land. Four centuries later, New Yorkers moved a river to make an engineering marvel forces that would be placed on those towers was such that the towers had to be anchored in rock, 60 to 80 feet down of an area that was four acres in size. How do you do that? Where the water ends and the land begins is part of the story of New York City. Take a walk with me along the edge of our island as we discover the waterfront secrets of New York. When George Washington was inaugurated president, uh, New York was a tiny little village of about 30,000 people. The built-up area didn't extend much beyond what is now Chamber Street. Within a human lifetime, by the time Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated president in 1861, the northern boundary of Manhattan had been pushed up to Central Park. That little village of 30,000 people had become a metropolis of over 800,000 people. The city grew so quickly that it seemed every time the first New Yorkers went out to take a walk, another empty lot was filled with houses. The city's expansion was driven by trade, and trade needed a place where merchants could unload their ships. But more than 25% of Manhattan was salt marsh and wetlands. They began to disappear quickly. What the first settlers found here was a swamp. We first started to harden the edges and to fill in in the lower part of the island of Manhattan and along some of the edges of the boroughs to create a hard edge on which to settle. Piers were built, slips for the ships that were coming in from across the Atlantic, and then off of those ships came the, the first immigrants and of course all the cargoes. that Francis Tavern at 54 Pearl Street is one of the city's oldest buildings. But you may not know that Pearl Street is the city's original waterfront. That means that New York Harbor once began right here. Pearl Street got its name from the piles of shiny mussel and oyster shells the native Lenape left on the shore. But after the Europeans arrived, it didn't remain the water's edge for long. After Pearl was filled in, Water Street, a block away, became the New Shore Line, then Front Street, then South Street, and finally the FDR Drive. So the city, in many, many cases, you can see where the edges were extended one era after the next after the next. A lot of the buildings that are on South Street and in that lower Manhattan area are based on a cribbing. A cribbing is simply a kind of crosshatch of timbers that lie float in the mud. And that's the foundation, they float, it's amazing. Frequently bits and pieces of ships, sometimes whole ships, would be cut up and laid in that space. If you bought a plot of land alongside the East River in the 1740s, the law required you to expand another 200 feet out into the water and create another city block of solid ground. 
It was a way for the city to make a place for ships to dock and do business. What's the most valuable thing in New York? It's real estate. As commerce expanded, you needed more facilities, you needed more warehouse space, you needed more office space, you needed deeper or larger, longer piers. So there was a kind of economic response to an economic stimulus that said, we need more land. Here's the secret of New York at 175 Water Street. This building's been an insurance company and a bank, but it actually began as an old ship filled with garbage when this block went from being water to Water Street in the early 1700s. The so-called Ronson ship was named after the real estate developer who built the office building here in 1982 and stopped work when the old timbers of a ship were discovered underground. It turned out to be a merchant vessel from British colonial times, the only example ever found of the kind of ship that made New York City an economic success. It would sail back and forth to London, filled with cargo from the New World, and when its life was over, it was sunk, covered with rubbish and dirt, and became a city street. The city started to go two ways. It began to fill in the edges, and then, of course, it began to move north. And so it, it shot up very quickly up, up through the island, and then the agricultural communities that were on, sort of in the Brooklyn area, those suddenly became second cities. Merchants concentrated on the East River because it was a safer landing spot for ships powered only by sails. The reason that we began on the East River, there are the natural forces of wind and tide. You can get into the lee of the bottom of the island, that is a little bit out of the wind so that you're able to maneuver a little bit better. The reason that it shifted to the Hudson, to the West River, was that you needed deeper water and you needed more facilities. Here's a waterfront secret you might pass every day. The East River really isn't a river at all. It's a tidal strait that connects two arms of the ocean. Rivers flow only one direction, but the East River changes directions every six hours. In fact, it was to protect sailing ships from the changing tides of the East River that New York City created its first great commercial docks and the land that surrounds them. Some of the buildings here in South Street Seaport are so connected to the old sailing vessels deep inside their foundation that archaeologists left the timbers in place rather than risk collapse. People walk on top of those ancient ships every day. Underneath some of the buildings in South Street, there are the bones of these old ships there. But that's not the real part for me. But for me, it's the understanding that everything that we are today was built on a contribution by someone then. The traditional story of New York starts when the Dutch come and Henry Hudson. And what we're trying to do is to remember the thousands of years that came before. Eric Sanderson is the creator of the Manahata Project, the original word for Manhattan Island. It took 10 years and 1,600 layers of scientific data to make a model of how the city looked four centuries ago. So the Manahata Project, it's kind of like a time machine in, in a way. Yeah, we're trying to discover what Henry Hudson might have seen 400 years ago. If we could take a time machine and be on his ship, the Half Moon, when it first sailed into New York Harbor, it turns out he would have found a really fantastic place, a place that was so robust and so rich with wildlife that we'd make it into a national park and be like the Yosemite of the East Coast. Sanderson was able to reconstruct over a thousand types of plants and animals in the original New York City using a kind of Facebook-style web of how different species relate to each other. But none of it would have been possible without a surprisingly precise snapshot of how the city looked 200 years ago, from which he could move backwards and forwards in time. The secret to the project was a, a map, this British headquarters map from the American Revolution that's 10 feet long and three and a half feet wide. And what we were able to do is put this map into the computer and then geo-reference it to the streets of the city today. So it's very accurate in terms of... It turns out it's extraordinarily accurate. Yeah, it took them eight years to draw this map. The British military cartographers who were here occupying New York City 
George Washington's trying to get in, trying to attack and take over New York City, um, and never, never succeeds. The British hold it for the entire war, and they bring the, some of the best cartographers of the time to come and make maps. And that meant that we could use our modern techniques to map the modern city against it. So let's take a look at Foley Square. 400 years ago, how did it look? Foley Square is built right on top of the old collect pond, which was the fresh water source for New York for its first 200 years. And if I zoom in and see underneath the map is the collect pond, you can digitize that and add the streams. So you see this building here that's shaped like a hexagon? Mm -hmm. That's the New York City courthouse. That's the building you see at the beginning of Law and Order I when see. the lawyers are walking up the steps. So what this means is if they could have walked down those steps and right into the collect pond at Foley Square 400 years ago. Oh, wow. So if I walked from Foley Square towards Chinatown, it would have been uphill. It would have been uphill. I'm just going to walk the map to the north. It's like Google Maps. It is like Google Maps, except for 200 years ago. <laughs> and we would have found Canal Street. This is actually originally the, the Kissing Bridge. The Kissing Bridge? As it was called on Broadway. That's right, where Broadway and Canal Street cross. And did people kiss there? In the early 19th century, yeah, it was a famous place. So what about Times Square? Let's look at Times Square. Yeah, so, so Times Square is really great. So we're it's gonna, so different, I'm sure. <laughs> we're going to go back south. And what we're looking at is Murray Hill, when Murray Hill was a hill. And just to the northern tip of Murray Hill is a dusty country road, <laughs> <laughs> which became Times Square. Dusty country road becomes Times Square as we know it today. In the colonial times, mm -hmm. if we go back to the Lenape times, it was famous for a, a beaver pond. Right just south of where the TKTS booth is, um, there was a beaver pond and a red maple swamp. One place on the Manahata computer map is a very old secret you can still visit. It's a hidden valley in Inwood Park in northern Manhattan, where the hills made it too steep for the British to cut down the forest. This is the clove, and some of the trees here are over 300 years old. They're one of the few connections to the old Manhattan Island, just like the rivers and streams. The streams have all been paved over by city streets, but you can still find one of them. So one of the few places you can still see a stream in Manhattan is up in the northern part of Central Park, and it's called Montaigne's Rivulet. And it's this stream here that runs underneath the Great Hill. This is the Great Hill in the northern part of Central Park. I had to see this original New York City stream for myself. What better guide than Doug Blonsky, president of the Central Park Conservancy? We're up here at the north end of Central Park, and this is the pool, which is actually my favorite locations because the trees around here are very mature and there's a beautiful reflection on the water. And this is one of the only water bodies in the park fed by a natural stream, and that stream was called Montaigne's Rivulet. It's still here today. So it was important, Montaigne's Rivulet, because it was the only natural water body that fed the creation of the entire park? Well, just for this location. The rest of the water bodies, they're completely man-made, and they're fed by city drinking water. This one, though, is a natural spring that actually fills this water body. So if we look down at this hole, and you can actually hear it, and you can actually see the water flowing, this was what was part of Montaigne's Rivulet. And what we're going to eventually do is call, follow the path of Montaigne's Rivulet right down into the Harlem Mirror. The man they named the stream after was a physician when the Dutch owned New Amsterdam. He was a member of the city council under Peter Stuyvesant, and he owned a lot of the land that became the north end of Central Park. And it turns out Dr. Montaigne shows up in another bit of the park's history. I actually want to show you something that's, that's really cool. This is actually the first drinking fountain in Central Park called Montaigne's Fountain. And about 15 years ago, we did a restoration project here, and we had to dredge all this out. And we found a picture of a chain coming off of this hook. We actually found the original ladle really? that was there for Montaigne's Fountains. And you would just dip the ladle down into the water and uh, get refreshed. So from what year are we thinking this is from? Probably the early 1860s. Oh, wow. The Central Park Conservancy was formed in 1980, when much of the park's infrastructure was broken. Just 20 years ago, the buildings in this part of Central Park looked like this. Today, the Conservancy's mission is to restore and enhance the park for future New Yorkers. 
Are people good about keeping the park clean? Yeah, what we've learned, but you know, we have 38 million visit Central Park every year. This is probably one of the most visited sites in the world. And if we stay on top of cleaning the park and taking care of it, then the public does as well. But if we don't do a good job, you will actually see the litter start accumulate. Uh -huh. Underneath our feet, Montaigne's rivulet continued to run east, past a huge tunnel made out of boulders. This archway is really unique. It's, it's beautiful. It's a rustic arch called the Huddlestone Arch. And what's neat about this, if you look up in it, there's no mortar or concrete. This is all boulders put together with gravity. And so he probably built a big wooden structure, set the boulders down on it, slowly took the structure apart, and then the rock just closed in on itself. And really, the whole thing is like a giant keystone. Huddlestone because the rocks are huddling are together. Huddling, yeah. mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. And so what's really cool is right above us is the roadway to Central Park, and mm -hmm. that's the Park Drive. Mm -hmm. You can follow the path of Montaigne's Rivulet to the northeast end of Central Park, where it flows into a lake called the Harlem Mere. But there is one last stage of the underground stream very few people get to see. It requires some special clothing. I'm ready. What are we approaching here? So this is the weir. This is what empties the Harlem Mere, or when the Harlem Mere fills up, this is where the water goes before it goes into the city's stormwater system. So this is 15 feet down. The mirror is low right now, so it's nice and safe. But believe me, if this was raining right now, you and I wouldn't be going down in there. Yeah. So you ready to go? Yeah. OK, you first. Oh, joy. Old mud really smells bad. Nasty. So this is the end of Montaigne's Rivulet? Yeah, this is it. We're 15 feet down from the ground level. And what you're looking at right here is this is the end of the Harlem Mirror and the end of the Montaigne's Rivulet. And when the mirror gets too high, the water cascades over this wall and then it basically goes out to the East River. It's not too high right now, is it? It's not too high right now, so we're safe. So it's nice and low. But if you got a big rain tonight, this thing would start filling up with water. Uh-huh. So you can anticipate, depending on the weather report, if it's going to rain a lot. Yep, there's another chamber right next to this. And if we know that it's going to rain a lot, we actually turn the valves to actually lower the Harlem mirror. This way, the mirror actually ends up being a retention basin. So we can kind of steady the pace that the water is leaving the mirror so we're not overflowing the city's stormwater and sewage treatment plants. And so this was constructed when? This was constructed when the mirror was constructed, probably in the late 1860s. So you're looking at some old stuff that not many people have ever seen before. In terms of the actual technology and the physics behind all this stuff, was it really advanced at the time? It was very advanced. The whole stormwater system of Central Park uh, was way ahead of its time. And in fact, the rest of the country kind of used a lot of what Olmsted and Vox created here to create all their stormwater systems in their cities. So we were very much ahead of our time here. This is really a secret of New York. Oh, absolutely. It is a real treasure. And to look at how they used to do the work, you know, over 150 years ago. I mean, even brickwork down here was very special to the Masons. Oh, I feel very special down here. It's a very cool place. As we talked, Montaigne's rivulet flowed above our heads into a storm drain under 5th Avenue and 106th Street, moving towards the East River. But the interesting thing is that 400 years ago, 106th Street was part of the East River. Well, 106th Street's interesting because there was this tidal inlet that was part of the estuary system that brought tidal water all the way to the edge of 5th Avenue 400 years ago. And if you walk on East 106th Street now, you'll see that it's twice as wide as the other streets around it. That's because there were once bridges on either side that span the water. The English even built tidal mills here, using the force of the East River to grind grain. I always like to think when I'm driving down the FDR highway, there's an exit on 106th Street, and I always think, I could have taken my boat <laughs> all the way from the FDR to Central Park right along here. Mm -hmm. In fact, if the water control system in Central Park stopped working and the sea level began to rise because of global warming, 106th Street might be underwater again, just like South Street Seaport, or just like one of the city's greatest construction projects, the World Trade Center. If you look at the big rectangle, which is the World Trade Center site, you see that it's half on land and half on water, straddling a beach. 
which is why they had to build a big cement bathtub, essentially, to keep the water out. It was to be the um, sort of the eighth wonder of the world, uh, the World Trade Center in New York, not only in terms of what it offered when it was completed, but in how it was constructed. Charles Makish was a young engineer who helped build the Twin Towers in the early 1970s. He became director of the World Trade Center in the 1990s. And now the idea was to construct down to bedrock. But how do you do that adjacent to the river? You know, you've got to hold back the water. You've got to hold back the force of the water and the force of the river and the force of the mud that's generated at the river's edge. The foundation for the Twin Towers was so massive that standard techniques like driving piles into the Hudson River wouldn't work. So in 1966, the Port Authority decided to use a method imported from Italy called the slurry wall. You're going to build eventually a wall that has four sides to it. It's a wall or a box, but it's totally buried when you finish building it. And you dig down 60 feet or 80 feet into rock. So now you have a trench that's three feet wide, 20 foot long, and 60 feet deep. But how do you do that without the walls of the, of the trench collapsing on you? Bentonite is a material that's found in nature. It's a mineral material. When you mix it with water, it has a structural strength to it. So now you have this panel that's filled with bentonite slurry. Now, the next thing you do is you put reinforcing steel in there. You build a cage that is 60 foot high, and you lower that cage into the bentonite. When the steel cage was in place, the last ingenious step was pouring concrete into the trench. Because concrete is heavier than betonite, it forced the slurry material to the surface, where it was recaptured to build another part of the wall. The result was a four-acre box they called the bathtub, strong enough to hold the two tallest buildings in the world. In the process, they excavated some very early waterfront history. Now, as they went down along Greenwich Street, Greenwich Street was the original bulkhead line. It's where the docks were back in the 16, 17, and 1800s. And there was a ship which apparently had burned in the harbor. It was an old sailing ship. And there were remnants of it found. There was an anchor found. Sometimes they found cargo. And in one instance, they found some old mead bottles with a wax top on them. Mead was a, a drink, I guess, of so some common usage back around the early 1700s. The construction workers found a case of this stuff and um, decided to sample it. So they took the, the wax top off of it and the cork and tasted it. I was told it, was, uh, it wasn't bad. You know, that was before the archaeologists were able to get to them and say, hey, guys, leave it alone. They sampled a little bit of uh, two to three hundred year old mead. When the foundation was complete, the Port Authority had to solve the problem of where to put the one million cubic yards of earth dug out of the ground. The solution changed the shape of downtown Manhattan again. What we did with the earth was we basically deposited it in the river. And we created four acres of land that we gave to the city of New York, which eventually became part of Battery Park City. The concept of Battery Park City was, in fact, that it was going to be a separate city adjacent to the existing city. It was only when the whole concept of Battery Park City changed and when the street grid was carried into Battery Park City and the sight lines were carried into Battery Park City that Battery Park City became the success that it is. It's the single largest landfill that Manhattan has seen. And because of that, I think it is historic and it is something that we can learn from. Today, more than 10,000 people live in Battery Park City with real estate values continuing to rise. It's part of the transformation of the entire area around the World Trade Center site. This new memorial is dedicated to those who perished on September 11th. The building's foundation, an engineering marvel 45 years ago, have been repaired and expanded, and the entire site is in the process of renewal. Oh, the momentum is remarkable. They're doing a floor a week. You know, the construction of the original Trade Center was a floor a week. Two 10-hour shifts, and I remember that vividly. The other towers, you see them, the foundations going in, and you see the construction going up. So that the whole site is starting to take form and shape. And it will be better than it ever was. Where the Dutch and English once sunk ships to build more streets, New York City now has a 10-year plan to develop over 500 miles of shoreline. It's called Vision 2020, and its goal is to catalyze waterfront investment 
improve water quality, and expand public access. Along the edges where industry once pushed out wildlife, we're building parks and planting oysters to clean the water. This island was here thousands of years before Henry Hudson sailed into the harbor. We'll make it to the next thousand if we make this place sustainable. And the secrets to preserving New York's environment are everywhere in this enduring city. You just have to know where to look for them. In the 1600s, New York City was like the Garden of Eden compared to the old, dirty cities of Europe.